Hey there, welcome to your deep dive. Large language models, that's what we're diving into today. Yeah. Something tells me you're already pretty fascinated by what they can do, but um, yeah. <laughs> as you probably know, all that brilliance, it- uh, Doesn't come cheap. It doesn't come cheap. Yeah. These AI systems are seriously computationally intensive. For sure. Luckily, uh, this yeah. research paper- Yeah, um, M2R2. M2R2. Mixture of multi-rate residuals for efficient transformer inference. Might have a few tricks up its sleeve. Right? Yeah. It's pretty technical. Yeah. But uh, we're going to unpack it together. Absolutely. It's like taking a peek under the hood of an LLM to see how it can be made to run more efficiently, especially on devices with fewer resources. A peek under the hood is a great way to put it. And we're not just talking about minor tweaks. Right. This research introduces a whole new technique called, as you mentioned, M2R2. Okay. But to really understand how it works, we need to start with some LLM fundamentals. All right, back to basics then. We've all heard about LLMs, but let's put it in simple terms. Yeah. What are they really doing? At their core, LLMs are all about predicting the next word. Uh-huh. Kind of like that autocomplete feature on your phone. Right. But on a much grander scale. Yeah. It's like asking a computer to write a novel. Okay. And it needs to carefully consider every single word and how it fits into the overall story. Right. That's a lot of processing power and a lot of factors to weigh for every single word. Okay, so that makes sense why they're so resource hungry. Right. But how does this paper propose to make things more efficient? Well, it all comes down to something called residual transformations. Okay. Think of these as pathways within the LLM that help preserve information as the model processes text. Uh -huh. They're crucial for accuracy, but they can also cause a bottleneck. Okay. The way LLMs traditionally work is that they apply the same level of processing to every word, mm -hmm. even if it's a simple word like uh, the or and. Mm -hmm. So they're spending just as much effort on a simple word as they are on, say, a complex scientific term. That seems- It is excessive. It is excessive. And that's where the researchers behind this paper yeah. saw an opportunity for improvement. Okay. They realized that not all words need the same level of processing. Right. And that's where the idea of residual velocity comes in. Okay, I'm intrigued. Is this some kind of measurement? Yeah, it is. What does it mean exactly? It's a way of measuring not just how far information travels within the model, but how fast it gets processed. Okay. Um, the analogy the paper uses is a highway. Mm -hmm. Some cars, or in this case words, can speed ahead in the fast lane right. while others need to take their time. I get the analogy. Yeah. But why would some words need to speed ahead while others lag behind? Doesn't the model need all the information to understand the text? That's a great question, and it gets to the heart of what the researchers discovered. When they actually analyzed the rate of information transformation in an LLM, they found something interesting. Okay. If you look at figure 2A of the paper, uh -huh. you'll see that the rate of change is very uneven. Yeah. The early layers of the model show a lot of change, but things slow down significantly in the later layers. Hmm. So it's like a burst of activity at the beginning, and then it settles into a more leisurely pace. If the rate of change slows down, does that mean those later layers are doing something different? You're picking up on a key insight. It does seem those later layers are doing something different. Okay. Instead of drastically transforming the information, they might be focused on integrating it, uh -huh. making subtle adjustments, or preparing it for output. This uneven rate of transformation okay. suggests there's room for optimization. Right. Why waste processing power on words that are already well understood by the model? It's like you're giving the LLM permission to be a little lazy, but strategically lazy. That's a good way to put it. Yeah. And that's where the real innovation of this paper comes in. A technique called M2R2, or mixture of multi-rate residuals. Okay. Essentially, it's a system for dynamically adjusting the speed of those residual transformations based on the complexity of the word being processed. So M2R2 is deciding which words get to zip along in the fast lane and which ones need to hang back? Exactly. Okay. It's like a traffic controller for the information flowing through the model. Yeah. But of course, it's not just about arbitrarily speeding things up. M2R2 actually uses some very clever tricks to keep everything efficient. Okay. 
I'm starting to see how this could make a difference. Yeah. But I'm curious about the specifics. How does M2R2 actually implement this traffic control system? Well, one key component is the use of what are called okay. accelerated residual streams. Uh -huh. These streams run in parallel to the main processing of the model. Oh, okay. And are designed to handle those simpler words or phrases that don't need as much attention. Parallel processing, clever. So it's like having an express lane Ex alongside the main highway. Yeah. But how do they make sure those accelerated streams are actually efficient? It seems like adding more processing could actually slow things down if it's not done carefully. You're right. It's a delicate balance. Yeah. That's where the real ingenuity of the M2R2 design comes in. Okay. To keep things efficient, these accelerated streams use a couple of key strategies. Okay. One is the use of low-rank adapters, mm -hmm. which are like specialized processing units designed for specific types of words or phrases. You mentioned low-rank adapters earlier, but I'm still not quite clear on what low-rank means in this context. Good point. Yeah. It's a bit of a technical term. Okay. Essentially, low-rank refers to the mathematical properties of the adapter. Okay. By using these low-rank adapters, the model can achieve similar results with less computation. Gotcha. Making the accelerated streams much faster. Ah, so it's like streamlining the calculations within those express lanes. Exactly. And what's the other strategy you mentioned? The second strategy is the use of shared memory caches. Okay. These are like temporary storage areas where the model can quickly access information that's likely to be needed again soon. Think of it like having a cheat sheet for common words or phrases. Right. So the model doesn't have to keep recalculating everything from scratch. It sounds like they've thought of everything. <laughs> but let's step back for a second. We've covered the theory. Sure. But now I want to see how this plays out in the real world. Okay. How does M2R2 actually improve things in practice? That's the exciting part. This paper isn't just theoretical. Yeah. They actually put M2R2 to the test. Right. And found some pretty remarkable results. They focused on three key areas. Okay. Where efficiency is paramount. Mm -hmm. Dynamic computing, speculative decoding, and mixture of experts MOE models. Let's break those down one by one. Okay. Starting with dynamic computing, what does that even mean? It means that instead of blindly applying the same amount of processing power to every part of the text, mm -hmm. the model can now adjust its effort based on the complexity of the task at hand. Mm -hmm. It's like being able to shift gears in a car. Okay. Depending on whether you're cruising on a highway right. or navigating a winding mountain road. Okay, so it's about allocating resources intelligently. Exactly. Does this actually translate into noticeable performance improvements? Absolutely. Yeah. In fact, the researchers found that M2R2 consistently achieved a better balance okay. between accuracy and speed compared to other methods. Right. If you look at figure seven of the paper, okay. you'll see some really compelling graphs showing how M2R2 outperforms the competition. It's like getting more bang for your buck in terms of computational power. That's what I like to hear, efficiency, ND, accuracy. Yeah. What about speculative decoding? Yeah. What is that and how does M2R2 improve it? Speculative decoding is all about prediction. Okay. Remember how we talked about LLMs being like supercharged, autocomplete? Right. Well, speculative decoding takes that to the next level. Yeah. It's the model's ability to anticipate what words or phrases are likely to come next. Okay. Even before they're typed or spoken. Gotcha. Um, this is particularly important for tasks like real-time translation uh -huh. or chatbot interactions, uh -huh. where speed is crucial. So M2R2 helps the model become a better guesser. Precisely. Which makes the whole process smoother. By analyzing the patterns and relationships within the text, okay. M2R2 can significantly improve the accuracy of speculative decoding. Okay. This means the model can generate text faster and more fluently right without sacrificing quality Ooh. and the results are quite impressive okay figure eight of the paper shows that m2r2 can boost speculative decoding speed ups by up to 2.8 times wow almost three times faster yeah that's a significant leap it is okay you mentioned a third area right moe models okay. i have to admit i'm not familiar with those mixture of experts models are a fascinating area of research imagine instead of having one massive general purpose llm Mm -hmm. You have a team of smaller, specialized models. Okay. Each an expert in a particular domain or task. It's like having a brain trust yeah. ready to tackle any challenge. Ah, so instead of one jack of all trades, right. you have a whole team of specialists. Exactly. How does M2R2 fit into this setup? M2R2's role in MOE models is all about resource management. Okay. By anticipating which experts are likely to be needed for a given task. Mm-hmm. M2R2 can preload them 
Gotcha. Saving valuable time and processing power. This is like having your team of experts ready and waiting in the wings. Right. Instead of having to scramble to find them when a specific challenge arises. Okay. I can see how that would be a huge advantage, especially if you're dealing with complex or multifaceted tasks. Exactly. But what kind of impact does this have in terms of actual performance? Well, according to the research, it has a pretty dramatic impact. Figure 9 of the paper shows that by accurately predicting and preloading the necessary experts, M2R2 can make MOE models 2.9 times faster. Wow. That kind of efficiency gain could be a game changer for deploying these sophisticated AI models in real-world applications. I'm sensing a pattern here. Faster, faster, faster. It seems like M2R2 is all about squeezing every ounce of performance out of these LLMs. You're catching on. But it's not just about raw speed. Right. It's about making these models more accessible, yeah. more adaptable, oh. and more efficient. Yeah. And that opens up a whole world of possibilities for how we interact with technology in the future. It really does feel like we're on the cusp of something big. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we've been talking about faster processing and more efficient models, but right. what does that actually mean for the average person? Right. How might these advancements change our everyday lives? That's the question, isn't it? Yeah. It's not just about making things faster for the sake of speed. It's about what that speed unlocks. Yeah. Think about it. If we can make LLMs significantly more efficient, uh -huh. they can run on devices with far fewer resources. Okay. Suddenly, powerful AI becomes accessible on your phone, right. your smartwatch, yeah. even embedded in everyday objects. Okay, now you're getting me really excited. I'm picturing a world where I can have a sophisticated conversation with my refrigerator, uh -huh. asking it to generate a grocery list. Right based on what's running low. Yeah. Or maybe my coffee maker can analyze my sleep patterns and brew the perfect strength coffee to get me going in the morning. I love those ideas. And it's not just about convenience. Imagine if real-time translation becomes seamless and ubiquitous. Yeah. Language barriers could effectively disappear. Wow. Opening up new avenues for communication and collaboration across cultures. That would be incredible. But it also makes me wonder about the potential downsides. If AI becomes that pervasive, how do we ensure it's used responsibly? Mm. And what about privacy? I'm not sure I want my coffee maker knowing my sleep schedule. Those are valid concerns. Yeah. And it's crucial that we have thoughtful discussions about the ethical implications of these technologies. Right. As AI becomes more powerful and integrated into our lives, mm -hmm. we need to establish clear guidelines yeah. for its development and deployment. Well said. It's clear that M2R2 is just one piece of a much larger puzzle. He did. But it's a fascinating piece, and it gives us a glimpse into what the future of AI might hold. Absolutely. If you're interested in exploring this further, yeah. I highly recommend checking out the full research paper. I agree. It's quite technical. Yes. But it goes into much more depth about the algorithms and the experimental results. It does. And who knows? Maybe you'll be inspired to come up with the next breakthrough in AI efficiency. Right. This deep dive has certainly given me a lot to think about. You too. Until next time. Yes. Keep those brains buzzing and stay curious.